Hello everyone, I greet you in the name of God Almighty. My name is Apostle Nathan Silas and today we have a very interesting video to react to and then this one was done by Douglas Murray and then the video says that Douglas Murray takes on Muslim activists and leaves them speechless. So the question is, what did they discuss that makes them speechless? Of course, when we get down to the video, we are going to know what they discuss that makes them very um, speechless. So guys, without any further ado, let's get down to this video and then check this out. You seem to almost suggest that they come to your countries with a lesser breed of values. No, I don't think I said that at any point, and that's another time you've tried to put something in my well, mouth. But I said, and before we got all confrontational, which you did from the get-go, I said what the problem is here is that these things are all rubbing against each other. Douglas Murray is at it again. This time, he takes on a host of Muslim activists in Qatar over immigration and the compatibility of Islam with Western culture. Douglas Murray did not hold back. Please. Hi, yeah, I'm Hamad Bahawash. I'm a senior at Georgetown University. And my question is to Mr. Douglas Murray. And before I ask my question, I just want to say, you said no sound bites, but then you said the developing world cannot move to the developed world. I don't know what that's I think about. I said it before. Uh, my question is, uh, since you brought up migration from the developing world, uh, I'd like to ask you this. Every year, the developed world sends about $300 billion of aid to the developing world, but the developing world sends back trillions in debt repayments uh, to the developed world. Now, um, don't you think that this is why, that this is the main reason why migrants are moving to Europe? Because money is moving out of the developing world. Wealth is leaving the developing world and moving to the developed world to build on what Lamont Hill said. Don't you think this is why people are moving to the Western world, to the developed world? Well, no, I don't. I don't. Uh, again, I repeat the fact there are no simple answers. And if it was simply the fact that you could, I don't know, do a debt default or something and solve the whole migration issue, then then that would be great. But it just isn't the case. You think that if, if, uh, if um, for instance, all uh, African countries were allowed to default on debt, that they'd become uh, uh, um, burgeoning, uh, flourishing uh, 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 societies? You think that the problem across, for instance, sub-Saharan Africa isn't just unbelievable greed and theft by politician after politician? You think that, that, that if you just wrote off the debt, that would stop being an issue and everyone would become transparent and clean in their dealings with money? I mean, the problems are much deeper than this. They're much deeper than just a, a simple solution like that. As, if I may just add quickly to the, the previous two uh, comments, the, the, the late, very distinguished American uh, diplomat, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, had a, a wonderful rule he came up with, known as Moynihan's Law, where he said that, that uh, human rights, claims of human rights violations often happen in exactly inverse proportion to human rights violations. That is, you hear about them in the countries that are most free. And before long, you can end up with the presumption that the most free countries are the ones who are most abusive of human rights. And this happens with the case when we talk about our leaders and the ones... It's all very well. We can, we can talk about the Trump administration, we can talk about the democracies and, and so on for, for all, we, all we like. We can all make criticisms, and we all should. But, OK, Briefly. Mr. Putin, what are you going to do about him? What are you going to do about the mullahs in Iran? What are you going to do about the House of Saud in Saudi Arabia? You see, what we end up with is this situation. We go, oh, Mr. Trump, Mr. Trump. We can all do that. Believe me, I can riff on but Trump again, all, you're being all quite day. Selective, aren't what you? are you going to do about the people you can't do anything about? Are you going to ignore them? Are you going to give them a pass? Well, or are you just going to enjoy beating oh, up on the democ I, I, democracy? I hate to have to interrupt you. There's something called democracy, though, isn't there? Elections. Notice how the woman leading the panel thinks that she has just debunked all of what Douglas Murray has just said by simply referring to democracy. The very crux of Douglas Murray's argument is that most often developing countries tend to have less functional economic and democratic structures internally, such that just getting rid of the debt by itself would not entirely solve the migration crisis. Political instability and conflict within countries can further destabilize economies and endanger lives, pushing individuals to seek safety and stability abroad. The World Bank's reports indicate that political instability and violence significantly impact economic performance, reducing investments and hindering economic growth. This, in turn, exacerbates unemployment and poverty, pushing more people towards migration as a means of escaping untenable situations. This debate is about to get even more heated. Another question, please. Um, so I'm going to talk briefly about you know, my mother's experience as an immigrant, and I want to touch on something that Malcolm on Hill said, this power of 
education and telling people how refugees fit into the wider context of economic development. Here's why I'm very skeptical about that. Because when my mother arrived in the UK and her parents arrived in the UK, people still called them dirty packies. When she had graduated from Oxford University, she was still a brown person who was not seen as a citizen, right? So to what extent can we really sell this idea that being educated or fitting X, Y, and Z criteria is what you need to do yes. as a refugee Good for people question. to humanize you. The inherent problem with these people is that they don't humanize you. You can't fulfill your oppressor's criteria so that they right. see you as human. So, so how do you humanize people? Dehumanizing refugees, thank you very much. And with this, let me go to you, uh, Douglas Murray. Because much of your uh, argument, Douglas, seems to be about the us versus them, the fact that, you know, we have our own values, our own Britishness, our own virtues, and they will come to our shores with their, their values, their tradition. They come to your countries with a lesser breed of values. No, Maybe. I don't think I said that at any point, and that's another time you've tried to put something in my well, mouth. Um, so when you talk about the difference the in list. values, what do you suggest? Um, look, uh, I, first of all, I didn't say that. I said that there are challenges, because we do know that there are challenges, and let, let's, let's just be frank about this. I mean, for instance, I, I've been in, in the Gulf for uh, the last week or so. Uh, I, I've... I see more burqas in my home city of London than I have seen in the Gulf in recent days, certainly here in Doha. Now, I can't say I'm delighted by the, the, the sight of more and more burqas in London. Do, do I feel any hatred of the people who wear them? Of course not, of course not. But I, I can't say I'm elated by it, and definitely there are times I think, you know, what percentage of burqas in this area becomes, like, not that pleasant for everyone else. But again, is it all down to burqas? Because again, you're not asking people in, with other traditions whether they care about the sight of people drinking alcohol well, or, or well, growing well, up in well, bikinis. You, well, again, well, it's a well, very we could, we could Western-centric viewpoint. I'm, I'm not, I have to say, you're, you're going to bark up the wrong tree if you think you're going to persuade a Brit that we should stop drinking alcohol because of people arriving in our country. I mean, that's not going to happen. The, these things well, are all a bit of give and take. You bring your but, own but, traditions that don't quite fit with theirs. Well, they don't. Uh, yeah, there, there, are, there are, as I said, and before before we got all confrontational, which you did from the get-go, I said what the problem is here is that these things are all rubbing against each other. And in that situation, you have to work out what things you're willing to give up, which things you're willing to compromise on, and which ones you're not. You're not going to persuade the Brits to massively change their culture. But let me just make the point. Every single society has certain aspects of it it doesn't want to give up. This one will in Qatar. This one will. Everyone does. So please don't which try to make this values? a kind of bigoted which of European thing. Very, very dishonest way to, to that would be a very dishonest but, 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 way to rush One of the critical insights to consider in this debate is the difference in foundational values between traditionally liberal Western societies and those governed by strict interpretations of Islamic law. Western democracies have evolved to place a high value on individual rights, including the freedom of expression and the separation of church and state. This liberal tradition encourages a marketplace of ideas where beliefs and opinions, including those on religion, are subject to scrutiny, debate, and even satire. Murray's concern is that the acceptance or imposition of laws and norms that restrict these freedoms in favor of protecting religious sentiments could lead to a chilling effect on speech and thought. It's a scenario where the fear of offending can stifle creativity, intellectual debate, and the critical questioning of religious and societal norms. This debate is not theoretical, but has manifested in various incidents that have sparked international controversy. By understanding the complex pathways to radicalization, societies can develop more effective strategies to counter extremist narratives and foster an environment where diversity and dialogue thrive over division and discord. Wow. That's a very interesting um, video, a very important um, question that that uh, Muslim um, activist actually asks um, Mori. But the truth about it is, let me be specific, okay? Let me be specific about some of these things and not to be very sentimental about it. Of course, I come from Africa. So let me use um, Niger for instance. Niger for an instance. Niger, in a sense, are blessed with um, uranium. And then you bear with me that because some of those things I'm going to say, of course, you can decide to verify them in a sense online if you want to. If you look at understand um, France nuclear plant, you realize that 50% of it 
or its um, uranium is getting from Niger. And then when you look at Nassan France, for instance, you see that France is what is a developed country. What about Niger? Niger is still underdeveloped. I will not say it's even developed, it's a developing country, but I will say that it's very underdeveloped. The people you understand in Niger, you understand, are suffering. They don't even have, you understand, these basic social amenities. When I talk about, you understand, good education, good water to drink, and all those things, right? And then if you see, look at Niger, you see that their economy is degrading day by day. And people are really, really suffering. I know that for some of you, in essence, who may be listening to me, some of you must have not traveled to Africa and then see some of those things in that is happening. And I just use this country, you know, as a case study, all right, for some of you to understand what you know, I am trying to say. Now, when you look at it, you can't be able to say that some of those major basic uh, social amenities I'm talking about is lagging in France. France have everything, right? But then, in exchange of Niger supplying all those things, in a sense, what does Niger actually benefit from it? You see? So, if you look at it, you realize that probably Niger is being given some little stiffing in a sense, out of it right while france in a sense is getting over 50 percent of its uranium to for them to, to power their nuclear plant right whereas niger are there struggling not even having it despite the fact that what they have the uranium but what is happening to them so do you now see why sometimes you understand it's not really about in a sense immigration and all those things i'm not saying that in the sense for people migrating from one place to another whether it's good or bad but i just believe that imagine that the niger economy or the, there's actually in a sense a good business between them there's a good trade okay between niger and then france and then niger itself in a sense is actually in a sense benefiting on this right do you think that there are a lot of niger people that want to migrate out of their country where they already have all it takes in a sense to have a very better economy or to be one of the best economy in the world do you care what i'm trying to say so these are some of the things that developing countries or all these underdeveloped countries in a sense are facing i am just in a sense using in a sense niger as a case study of course you can look at in a sense several in a sense countries you could look at in a sense burkina faso you could get to realize that when you check it you can verify some of this you see that 50 percent of their export in a sense goes to france so how do they expect such countries in a sense to develop how how are they going to develop do you understand? So those are the some of the things that is really, really happening to some of you understand these countries. And I'm just using this some of these African countries as an instance, and then this kind of cut across in a sense all the countries all over the world, especially most of the underdeveloped. And I just know that most of the underdeveloped end up in a sense being here in Africa, and most of the developing in a sense still here in Africa. And that's why in Africa you can't really mention two or three countries that are really developed. She will just talk about only South Africa and where again. Because Nigeria is still, you understand, developing. Do you understand? So you got to realize that most of them are developing and underdeveloped countries. Do you understand? And then you see that, you understand, the West are actually benefiting a lot, you understand, when it has to do with, you understand, Africa and then the economy. That's just the truth about it. That's why I say I don't have to be sentimental, you understand, about it. But well, I could say that, of course, the West didn't just come to Africa and be taking all these things, right? But then it is our people, our leaders who actually supported this for their selfish reasons as being the reason why we are facing what we are facing. So, Mori can just say whatever he say on or of course, you know, he don't have total control over it. I am not saying that, of course, because we migrate to America or maybe some people to the UK, then it automatically means that we should... Um, that he must in a sense follow their values we have our own values they also have uh, their own values but then as we are there let's try to respect their own values likewise when they are also in our countries they should also in a sense respect in a sense our own in a sense culture because there are a lot of things that we don't do but when you go there to the west in a sense they do them but then since you know where you come from you are not supposed to do them despite the fact that you may be there you can't change them so let it just be but then the ones that you know you can speak to them you can speak to them the ones that want to listen to you so be it others that don't want to listen to you then so be it but we can't be able to like force our culture on people but then it's actually a very interesting one and i know that a lot of you have total opinion concerning this i wanted to draw 
drop it at the comment section because this one is actually something that kind of calls for a lot of dialogue and i hope that we will learn from one another so this is the end of my video if you like my reaction should like share and subscribe if you have any video you want me to react to don't forget to drop it at the comment section and i'm going to check it out so guys you remain blessed and i see you in my next video bye bye